Well, thanks for joining us today. You know, Idaho students are heading back to their classrooms starting next week. Some have already returned, which is a welcome transition for students, families across the state. As I've stated from the start of COVID-19 pandemic, our students need to be able to learn in their classrooms with their teachers and their peers. Our main defense in ensuring the new school year is entirely in person, free from outbreaks and quarantines is the COVID-19 vaccine. Even with the highly contagious Delta variant circulating in our communities, which is twice as contagious as the original strain, we can give our kids the best chance at a normal school year if Idahoans choose to receive the vaccine. Just over half of Idaho's adult population is vaccinated, with the greatest share of those vaccinated over the age of 65. I want to thank those more than 770,000 Idahoans for choosing to protect themselves, their loved ones, our economy, our, student, our students by making that choice. To the other half of Idaho adults and the 12 to 17 year olds who have not received the vaccine, I understand there are many who simply will not receive the vaccine under any circumstance. But there are also a lot of others who are on the fence about receiving the vaccine. To those friends and neighbors of ours waiting to receive the vaccine, the time to get the vaccine is now, when our students are going back to school. We can minimize or eliminate disruptions in the delivery of education, as well as sports and extracurricular activities during this school year, if Idahoans choose to be vaccinated. Our younger population, children under the age of 12, cannot receive the vaccine and they need us. The adults to make the right decision now so that they can stay well and have a productive and successful school year. Parents 12 to 17 year olds and 17 year olds are also encouraged to have your children vaccinated. Your children's pediatrician can help you if you have questions about the vaccine. And I encourage you to make an appointment to discuss your questions. 195 million Americans have received the vaccine safely. The risk of death or serious injury is extremely low. By comparison, the risk of death or hospitalization from COVID-19 disease is much, much higher and it's growing. I'd like to share some Idaho specific COVID activity in our state. The vaccine protects you. Almost all new COVID cases, COVID hospitalizations and COVID deaths in Idaho since the start of the year were people not vaccinated. Since May 15th, there's been 10 times as many COVID cases 13 times as many COVID hospitalizations, eight times as many COVID deaths among unvaccinated people compared to vaccinated people. The vaccine slows the spread of the disease. We need the disease to stop now. There are signs already that we may be in trouble the next few days and weeks if we don't slow things down. Idaho hospitals, are once again filling up with COVID patients, almost all unvaccinated, and access to basic health care services is pinched for the rest of us in order to care for them. That means people with planned surgeries may have those surgeries delayed. People that suffer from a heart attack or stroke may find there's no adequate bed available in their local hospital. If more Idahoans do not choose to get vaccinated now and in the coming days and weeks with the high, highly transmissible Delta variant now circulating widely in communities across Idaho, our epidemiologists say projections indicate case counts could continue to increase through the fall 
and exceed last year's peak for daily case counts. This impacts our workforce. We cannot afford to have such a large share of our workforce out sick all at once. Our workforce cannot afford to stay home because schools and daycares shut down due to outbreaks. This threatens Idaho's phenomenal economic success. Our hospitals won't be able to take the influx of patients. And importantly, it is not fair to our students who will experience disruptions in their school year. I have directed $20 million towards expanded testing in Idaho's K-12 schools to help us meet testing needs. And our back to school task force made up of public health and education stakeholders has been working hard to ensure there is standardized guidance out there for school leaders as they navigate this school year. I have with me today, Andrea McNutt, a Spanish teacher right here in Napa High School to share some of her perspectives on the school year. Andrea. Uh, thank you, Governor Little. My name is Andrea McNutt and I'm starting my seventh year teaching at Spanish at Napa High School. As a high school teacher and a parent of an elementary student, I've seen firsthand the importance of in-person learning. Spending the last year and a quarter of the previous year watching the impact of online learning on students, I've watched the many emotions that come along with distance learning and a constantly changing schedule. I watch my students thrive in class and disappear when we switch to online. I watched my daughter cry as she realized she wouldn't be able to do her end of year performance in music class to waking up at five in the morning because she was so excited to be reunited with the other half of her class. I woke up wondering if daycare was going to be open that day or if we were going to have to find last minute care for my youngest. In my classroom, we built relationships through turned off cameras and I got to watch them flourish in person during hybrid learning just in time for another outbreak to bring us back online before Christmas. I watched my students come back to a new semester unsure when we would be pushed back online and watched them cheer in my class when we were told we'd be back full time. I watched my students' attitudes change from one of extreme frustration to one of elation and willingness to try because maybe with Mrs. McNutt standing by my desk, I'll give it a try and get her off my back. The impact of in-person learning on a student is immeasurable. We have spent a year and a half talking about the resilience of students and their ability to handle change. And I've never been more impressed with my students than I was this past year. The reality is this year was difficult. The changes were difficult on everyone. As a staff, we, learned, we leaned on each other more than ever. We spent our lunches discussing ways to transition from online to hybrid, to back online, hybrid again, and finally full-time in person. We discuss the anxieties that come with each transition and how to support our students through each one. In my classroom, the unknown was challenging for many students. For many of them, school is a source of stability. This coming year, I hope to have my students in class full time for the entire year, but I know that my hoping will not be enough. Our ability to be in school full time hinges on a variety of factors, some of which are in our control and some that are not. I look forward to a year where my students come to my classroom dressed in their Napa High gear to cheer on peers at a game that night. I look forward to the staff spending time together in person. I also look forward to watching my daughter perform in her music class concert in person. I know that in-person school is beneficial and I've seen the effects that a changing schedule has on students, parents, and teachers alike. Full-time in-person school for the whole year is a dream I would love to see come to fruition. Please take necessary precautions to ensure that schools can stay open fully all year round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll try and answer your questions. Yes. Well, I would, I mean, our reason uh, for being here today is we want kids back in school. And what we've done all along is allow school administrators, trustees uh, to make that determination. 
you well know how the numbers go up and down. And you just heard from Andrea about uh, what what we did, what they did here in Nampa in this school district. So I guess the answer to your question is it depends. It depends upon what the rate is. We, you know, a couple of weeks ago, we saw these numbers going up and that's why we scheduled this because we, you know, the secret is obviously getting more people vaccinated. Uh, there's a number that we had in mind uh, before and and we just haven't reached that level in many counties in Idaho. There's some we have, not very many, uh, but we just want to encourage everybody. So it, it really depends upon the district they're in, but we want people to have their kids in school, uh, but it's, it's going to depend upon how many more people get vaccinated and what the protocols are in the schools. Have we reached that level here in Kennedy County? Where you want to see and is, are the precautions that are being taken around this community adequate? Uh, I, I can't tell you. I can tell you that the one thing that will help is if more people get vaccinated. That's of all the issues that we've gone through, you know, a year ago when we were doing this, we didn't have vaccine. Now we've got the vaccine. That is literally uh, the thing that's the most helpful is, is all this angst for school teachers, administrators, school boards, parents will be significantly uh, lesson if more people get vaccinated. And that's the message we want to get out today. Scott? Governor, sir, um, just a second ago, you, you said the secret is getting vaccinated. Well, perhaps it's not really a secret because it seems like we know that uh, with all due respect. Fair, that's fair. But my question is, the, politi the, the politics involved in this, there are so many people who don't want to get vaccinated for their personal reasons. Um, when I say politics, I don't mean necessarily political parties. How? What can you do to bring these two factions together? It's almost like there's two parts of the state, maybe two parts of the country, those who want to get vaccinated and have gotten vaccinated and those who don't and maybe won't. How do you bring that together? Well, it, and I talked about a little bit in here. Uh, there's some of them that are and believe me, we've done a lot of analysis. So have my fellow governors all over the United States. We talk uh, quite frequently about what they see in their areas. And and a lot of what we see in Idaho is prevalent in other states. The big change is the Delta variant. You know, the how 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 much more it spreads and and the fact that now we're having some uh, breakout cases. But of course, even if you have a breakout case, these statistics are incredibly compelling that if you get the vaccine, uh, we're fine. But what's changed, we believe me, uh, last June, July, you, you know, last June, July, I never thought I'd be where we are today. But I will tell you uh, that when this first started, uh, my uh, coronavirus ad advisory group told me, and I, I can remember him saying it in March of last year, Viruses will do what viruses do, and that will, will they will continue to mutate and try and make it to where uh, they can proliferate. And uh, the Delta variant has been one of those mutations that has exacerbated that. With our vaccine level we had before, and and the fact there are a few people getting vaccinated all the time, the message here today is we have to have a much higher uh, vaccine rate, uh, given the the Delta variant uh, for everybody to be back in school. Quick follow up, but I've heard health experts say that it may take overflows at hospitals, more deaths, unfortunately, for things to get really bad before people will come together on this. Are, are you concerned about that? And yes, again, I'm, I'm talking about bringing together people politically, uh, philosophically on this whole thing. Yes, and that's what's happening. We get, uh, you're all aware of what's taking place at Kootenai right now in, in the Coeur d'Alene area uh, where they're at capacity. Uh, the, the local hospitals here have some significant issues, but the, the dashboard that I get about hospitals, if there's a vaccination rate that's higher, there's a green line for hospital capacity. If they've got a lower vaccine rate, there's orange and red, and that's the point we're trying to get out. 
comments, you said 20 million for extra testing, but the release says 30 million. Which, which uh, did I, I perhaps, what is it, Emily, is it 20 or 30, Greg? 30. And where's that coming from? Well, we have some funds that are, uh, that we've got set aside that actually for the last two years for whatever we need to do and we're we're making those available there was as you're well aware there was some some funds that was available that we didn't that we didn't tap into and we're making those available today uh, so that the school administrators can plan on them and will that be just available for them to use as they yes it? and that was for i'm sorry governor that testing is for specifically uh, the 30 million dollars is for testing for specifically what group well uh, for k12 k12 yeah thank you james uh governor you kind of alluded to this uh house republicans rejected that 47 million dollars for testing uh you know a few months ago uh what authority do you have to release this money now since it wasn't built into the budget? this this isn't part of that 40 million this is other money that the legislature last year gave us for kind of whatever we need to do uh, for COVID. So this is exclusive of those ARPA dollars that were there that didn't get appropriated. And, and why do you think it's important now to make these funds available when uh, lawmakers who represent the Nampa area, for instance, rejected that money saying it was completely unnecessary or, well, or too much money? It, it, I would have preferred that they did that, but I have to deal with the hand that I'm dealt. and. Fortunately, we have these emergency funds uh, that we have to make available to the school district uh, to do what they think is necessary. Well, we, as we have all along, we want to create the best possible atmosphere for people to do the right things. Uh, incentives, whether it's resources or other incentives we can give to local school districts. Uh, we don't want the scenario uh, that Scott talked about to where the hospitals are all plugged up. We've got a lot of people dying. That That is what we're trying to avoid at all costs. But, you know, we've seen, we had a grand experiment the last 17 months about you know uh, particularly in the in the rural states uh, not in the midwest in the west and i am convinced that as i stated in my comments multiple times we want people to choose to do the right thing and that's what that's the strategy we've had and we're going to continue with it but that's why we asked you all to be here today was to make the point that this is very very serious Well, it's the it, it's the incredibly compelling statistics about hospital capacity, about case counts, about positivity rates, about deaths, about hospital capacity. Uh, you know, we've been watching them for the last. Uh, uh, let me tell you all a, a brief story. Uh, I my healthcare team have just done an incredible job, and about a month and a half ago. I was going to take them all to lunch and we we're going to celebrate. And I had a conflict and I couldn't do that. And we ended up postponing it. But instead of a celebration meeting, it was, you know, here's all the statistics of what's going on. So, uh, you know, the Delta variant and the lack of vaccine uptake in the state of Idaho just changed the trajectory that we thought we were on. And many of you have written a lot about it and we just need to get the message out more. So. Well, there's always going to be some of those. Uh, and as I said, when I uh, converse with my fellow governors, uh, there's there's a percentage of those in every population. And you talk to the epidemiologists and the people that do modeling about, you know, what what uptake rate do you have to have along with people 
that either had symptomatic or asymptomatic that have some level of immunity. And we're learning more and more every day that that's not an adequate level of immunity. So it's a combination of those things uh, and the incredible spread from the Delta variant that means that we've gone uh, if I had my old graph that you're used to seeing behind me of, of hospital capacity, uh, which we, Director Jepson and I always said was our North Star, and we're getting too close on that. And that's why we're making this money available to schools and we're doing all these other things. So, are, are yeah. Oh, there's uh, uh, there no question. There's some people made up their mind, but we, as we do our surveys and other states do these surveys, we know that there's people that are, you know, th that are still on the cusp of making the right decision. And I was probably less aggressive than some of the other governors because I wanted to see a lot of people get vaccinated. I wanted to see the numbers, you know, we've got literally billions in the world and hundreds of millions here in the United States. To me, that should be should give confidence to those people that were on the fence about choosing to get vaccinated. Is there a point where the state would recommend schools return to remote um, instruction if they recommend or require? Well, the, the, the task force, the state board, the Department of Education, the stakeholders, the trustees, the administrators, that's, they did a great job. Uh, you know, remember a lot of states around us were one of my staff members went to a graduation and her niece had been in school for seven days all of last year we what we did in idaho and it wasn't perfect everywhere but really compared to a lot of other schools we did pretty well and i'm going to continue to rely on their advice and counsel what were your plans for the 30 million that, that 30 million was part of the was an appropriation that the legislature gave us for whatever relative to COVID. And that's uh, this, as I said, I would have preferred uh, that they utilize the ARPA dollars that were there, but uh, it's it's critical now. We've got to have, the these school districts got to have some resources uh, because, you know, testing is a motivator. Uh, you know, people don't want to be tested. Get And, the, and then of course, we're going to have to do testing in those younger populations that aren't eligible for a vaccine. So we, we just had to make that available. So, but did you have plans for the 30 No, we just, we, this, the, the whole COVID-19 has been such a dynamic process with a lot of changes and, you know, uh, the, you know, nobody anticipated that the vaccines would be as successful as they were. So, you know, the particularly the two mRNA vaccines are, are very successful. So we've just had some resources aside for whatever we needed. And that's where we're deploying that 30 million. So, Audrey. So the situation we're in right now is quite different from the fall and winter surge. Um, we've got a burned out healthcare workforce. Um, they're exhausted. They are mostly vaccinated, which is good. So we're not going to have a whole lot of them calling in sick and things like that. Um, however, last time you would see pop-ups of fires around the country, and then they would sort of burn out. And so travel nurses could go from hotspot to hotspot. The entire country right now basically is on fire. So we're going to run out of the resources of the travel nurses. Uh, We've got a virus that spreads and infects you very quickly, may cause more serious conditions. We don't really know that for sure. I've talked to a lot of healthcare workers who are worried that we're gonna hit crisis standards of care. We didn't hit it in the last surge, which was, which was really, really good. I think everyone was very relieved about that, but they're worried now and they don't have those National Guard nurses um, the travel nurses are going to be less easy to get. What can you as governor do to ameliorate these problems? What can you can you add to their workforce? What can you do? Yes, we we, we, we I had conversations with uh, the Idaho Office of Emergency Management and the National Guard uh, in the last two days. And we're talking about what we can do. We had we had the guard in there. Uh, we pulled the guard out. We thought there were going to be some critical exercises 
that the guard needed to go to. There's some question whether that's going to happen. So we're we're exploring making the guard available uh, and and what we can do. Uh, but but I want to talk about what you talked about to begin with. We're, this this is such a wild issue. But the one thing that we're looking at is what's happening in, in Great Britain that had the Delta variant and their numbers, we think, are going down. So we continue to watch what's happened. You know, our epidemiologists, uh, we continue to watch what's happening elsewhere. But it is alarming about just the case rate that, you know, I out of sheer excitement, I get up and look at my, our ranking in The New York Times every morning. I really have a strange life. Um, but you know but it's but it's interesting uh some of the states uh that are ahead of us and some of the states that are behind us and it's just you know somebody's going to write a big book about COVID 19 after we've had enough data and know what's happening but right now with what we know we believe uh there's no question that getting more people vaccinated because a year ago we didn't have the vaccine so sir are you you say you've uh, had conversations uh, with the national guard uh and the emergency folks in the last two days or yep. two weeks two days are you going to deploy the guard again soon in in, in the next few weeks we're at, we're having those conversations about who's available uh what and then we're t talking to the requesters the healthcare providers about what they need do you expect to deploy the guard again soon don't be surprised sammy The state board and the department will, and that committee will, will do that. Isn't that correct, Greg? Yep. Um, you know, why is it useful for districts to have these testing funds as opposed to referring a kid out to their physician? Experience? According to which? Uh, uh, rather why is it useful for districts to have the testing funds instead of, you know, sending kids out to their doctor? Well, <laughs> my goal is to get kids back in school and districts as, as they look at their mix and maths of what they're doing about spacing about all the other things about kids being in school we just want to uh, help them with the resources they need uh, to get these this gym back full of people for basketball season but i'm knocking on wood about that right now so Well, as I said, I look at those numbers every day and some of the states that have got that are doing well and some of them aren't doing well. All I know is what we've done in the past and what I believe worked. And that's making an earnest plea with the people of Idaho to do the right thing. And uh, it, it's, I, I think this morning, Idaho was ahead of both Oregon and Washington in our case counts. So that says something, so. Yeah, Katie, or Keith, your press secretary there, so. Appreciate that. Talk about the, the vaccine rate to get people getting vaccinated. It looks like, in fact, more people are getting vaccinated lately from if my real estate health department numbers. Uh, 11,000, weekend of July 11, climbed steadily up to August 1, 18,000. Um, is that enough? I mean, first, I've heard comments about more people getting vaccinated and then 18,000, is that enough or do you want to see that? I want to see it more. Uh, and and actually goes a little bit of what Scott talked about. Uh, uh, and I was just talking to a couple of the administrators about uh, a good friend of Teresa's mind from Emmett that knows somebody that's uh, an educator that's in an ICU right now at a very young age. And uh, that's an absolute travesty but I think as people become aware of that, that vaccine rate's gonna go up. But we're not getting the vaccine rate up at, at I, I would love to go back to the days when I was rationing vaccine. We're not even close to that right now. And fortunately in this country, we've, we've got a lot of inventory that's available. And that's, that, that actually goes to part of the reason that, because uh, the, the, the healthcare community is gonna do, be doing, taking care of patients doing more testing and hopefully doing more vaccine. So that's why we got to have 
a, an increased workforce to help them get through those over those three hurdles that are out there right now. So we, 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 we need to have the rate go up, but it is encouraging that people are, which goes to the question are, are these people really people that aren't gonna get vaccinated? And a lot of it is just a matter of convenience. It's pretty darn convenient right now. And, and we wanna make it more convenient, but we, we just put out a new ad yesterday. I think you saw the, I think the ad was a person from Nampa, Idaho. We just continue to try and put out a message there to encourage people to do the right thing. Audrey. Uh, regarding schools, uh, I analyzed the data from case reports from schools and compared that with school-aged children uh, cases from the state's numbers. And it was about double what the schools actually reported. Uh, certainly some of those children were learning from home, that sort of thing, but definitely not half of them. Um, so would you like to see more reporting this school year so that the public understands the size of outbreaks at school? Well, the short answer is yes. Uh, but, you know, we want, uh, I would, council administrators and and trustees that as they try and convince their patrons to do the right thing for their children uh, that that transparency is always and you know some of it is you know the school year hasn't even started a lot of a, a lot of staff is uh, just coming back right now and next week so you know i i wouldn't fault them on the data right now uh, because they're not back in in full mode but you know, I always opt for more transparency so that people know what's going on. Uh, I, it, you know, there might be a little gain by holding that data back, but in the long term, it's, it's never the right thing to do. You want to have that information available. So. Okay, one more question. Well, you were clear out here in right field, so I didn't see you. Our, uh, our vaccines are currently approved for emergency at that point they can be mandated as you like or as you of course know um, schools do require certain uh, vaccinations there are exemptions of course for parents would you be in support of um, adding COVID-19 to the list well of the, required vaccinations? the the list that's out there is I, th I think it's a rule by the I know it's a rule by the Department of Health and Welfare uh, so they'll they'll have to consider that uh, but I would tell you that the EUA, my understanding from my calls with uh, uh, with other states and with the White House, is that is that EUA is probably only going to go off on Pfizer to begin with, and then Moderna, and then maybe J and J. But the fact of the matter is, a lot of EUAs go off when there've been 2,000 vaccinations. We've had 200 million vaccinations and billions worldwide. So the data's there, a lot of what they're doing on the EUA, and I, I'll defend the FDA a little bit on this. We want everybody to be comfortable. We don't wanna make it look like it's a rush to judgment. We want them to, that we're checking all the boxes to make sure we know the vaccine works. What they're actually checking right now is the facilities. They're going in and saying, if you're gonna make 100 million more doses, will this, these manufacturing facilities do that safely and adequately. So it's actually more of a quality control rather than the efficacy of the vaccine. Because, you know, all these other vaccines are released. Nobody had an app on their phone that was calling them up every two days and saying, how are you doing? They were basically reported by doctors. Now we've got a much better feedback loop, which I think will serve society well into the future. And you don't have to do that. It's an opt in. But our ability to determine the efficacy of it is much more sophisticated now than it was before. But the EUA, uh, when they go off, I know a lot of people say when the EUA goes off, uh, I will advocate for get the vaccine. We'll see when that happens. All right. Thank you all very much.